All right, audio. Hi, everyone. Okay. So the rain, huh? All right, well, thank you all three for showing up. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, we're gonna go through this. Uh, honestly, I'm gonna talk until I get to the breaking point, and then we're gonna, oh, come on. We're gonna basically chat until I get done talking about what I wanna talk about, and then we're gonna get out of here. Um, <clears throat> I am so behind on everything that my job asks me to do, so. Hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm planning on having y'all's exams graded by the end of the week, because um, I know you took them last week. Um, I've started, and by started, I mean I've graded like eight of them, so I have no idea what the average looks like. Um, but yeah, basically, I'm gonna just jump into it. We're gonna pick up where we left off, and we're going to go until we start talking about virtual memory. So, um, yeah, not really much to kind of, you know, mention in the meantime. We are on pace to get out of here. Um, all we really have left is uh, finishing up lab four, if you haven't already. But other than that, it's just lab five and our final, which again is going to be on the last day of lecture, which for us is the literal last day of classes. So um, I will be asking, we're probably going to have a day where I just cancel class because we don't have anything left to talk about. Um, I'm gonna just decide which day that is. But I'll bring that back up next week. Um, so for now, <clears throat> I kinda wanna try and jump back into the manic rambling that I was doing yesterday, or Tuesday, whatever it was. And um, I wanna jump back in by kind of just refreshing what we were talking about, which was, I'm not going through those back and forth. Mostly I just wanna talk about like what we were really spending our time talking about on Tuesday was memory, storage of data. Right? <clears throat> the main thing that we saw was the memory hierarchy. And we talked about the memory hierarchy in terms of, you know, um, cost per bit. And um, we showed that registers are at the tippy top. They're the fastest they, to be accessed and to be modified, but they're also very costly and expensive. So we only use them in very small quantities. Whereas the farther we go down, we have more bits as they're cheaper to utilize and <clears throat> typically slower access times. And what we were really sinking our teeth into in the latter half of lecture last Tuesday was we were talking about the um, traditional spinning disk hard drive, right? We talked a little bit about random access memory and the different ways of storing bits for uh, random access during the computer's uh, you know, usage. But the thing about random access memory is that it requires power to maintain its information. And so if you have a situation where you want certain data, certain bits, certain information to persist beyond power down, then you need to store it somewhere that isn't your random access memory, which is either primary storage, like a hard drive, which is internal to your machine, or secondary storage, which is external to your machine. Um, in the modern day, we can think of external storage as like the cloud, um, but it also might involve something weird, like a tape backup, or something more common, like an external hard drive. Okay. So all of those would be considered secondary storage. But we really sunk our teeth into primary storage, right? We talked about how there were two really main categories of primary storage. We talked about how there was read-only memory, right? It was like a program code or other information that was burned onto a chip and that every time you booted up your machine, that data would be present on the chip, but it was read-only. You cannot write any information. And we also kind of showed that over time, we developed more and more technologies that were similar to read-only memory, but they allowed writing, right? And at first it was, you know, you could rewrite it, but only with special tools and techniques. And then it was, you could rewrite it if you had um, electrical signals, but only if you had specific programmers. And then it was started getting to creating um, what is commonly referred to as flash memory, right? EE proms kind of evolved into flash memory, where we ended up just taking a bunch of memory cells and we got so good at making them and we got so good at allowing them to be kind of rewritten 
that we ultimately were able to stitch them together into larger and larger chunks of memory that would persist in its data after power down. And so that was kind of where we got to memory, and I kind of put a pin in that, and then we talked about our traditional spinning disk hard drive. And we talked a lot about how it works, we talked about how the magnetic plates are, or you know, how there's like plates um, that have a surface with magnetic residue or flux on them, and uh, yada, 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 we can use a read-write head to actually read the bits and ones and zeros off of this platter. And that was kind of where we left off. And where I kind of want to pick back up is just the tail end of that hard drive conversation, right? So spinning disk hard drives were the de facto standard for about 50 years in program and just in computing. Um, from their emergence in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, uh, particularly the early 1980s is when you start to see the first mainstream hard drive um, formats and um, standards start to emerge. And I believe 1982, you have MFM hard drives really start to become a market. Um, and hard drives uh, start to kind of pick up speed from the, late or from the early 80s uh, onwards. And by the 2000s, everyone has a hard drive, right? All machines have hard drives and their range is somewhere in the megabytes, maybe one or two gigabytes by the, you know, by 2000, 2001. Um, and through the 2000s and into the 2010s, hard drives kept getting better. They kept getting more efficient, they kept getting more reliable, they kept getting larger and larger and larger, could store more and more data. But for as much engineering marvel as the uh, development of hard drive technology was, there were still some intrinsic inherent flaws to spinning disk hard drives. Primarily that they're spinning disks, right? They're physical parts that have to physically move. And we saw that the layout of a spinning disk hard drive we saw on Tuesday, um, like a single platter is made up of tracks, each track is made up of smaller sectors. And so if we want to look at different um, tracks on a disk, right, we have to move the read-write head over the specific track we want to read. But if we want to read a specific sector of that track, we have to wait until the platter rotates that sector underneath the read-write head. So basically, we, we refer to this as rotational latency. The idea that in a spinning disk hard drive, there is physical components that need to move in order for the read-write head to be aligned with the data we want to read in. And but depending on our situation, that rotational latency can go from a minor annoyance to a very large penalty, right? If we have to read a contiguous or linear track of data, we line up the read write head once and then we just start reading the data and the spinning of the underneath platter just puts the next piece of data underneath the head when we need it. But if we need to start ping-ponging across the drive, we need to read one sector and then another sector, then another sector, then another sector, we might end up having to move the read-write head all over the place and wait each time for the disk to spin and put the specific track we want underneath that head. The details are really only there in so much to justify the conclusion, which is to say that there were intrinsic latencies and intrinsic delays that a spinning disk hard drive would always have. No matter how good you got them, no matter how fast you got the platter spinning, there was always going to be a level of latency and delay that the physical structure of the device would provide and cause. This became a problem because the CPU is just so damn fast, right? The spinning disk hard drive from a human's perspective is rip-roaringly fast. The rewrite head flicks across the spinning disk almost instantaneously in our perception. The disk is spinning at such a fast rate that our human eyes couldn't track a point on the individual disk platter. It would, if you put a Sharpie mark on the, which would ruin this by the way, but if you put a Sharpie mark on just like a dot, on the platter, the platter is spinning so fast that your human eye would track it as just a ring. It's a single dot on the thing, but because the platter is moving so fast, your eye cannot perceive the individual dot and it kind of blends the, sh the, the color into just a single ring in the disc, right? That's like an optical illusion effect. 
So basically, my point being is that although the hard drive is moving at physically astronomical speeds, the CPU is moving at even more astronomical speeds. And so the, 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 the disconnect means that no matter how fast we make the spinning disk hard drives, it's going to be slow relative to our CPU. <sighs> And the thing that provides that slowness are the physical properties of the hard drive. The fact that the hard drive needs to move the read-write head and wait for the platter to spin into place is a speed penalty that is unavoidable and unfixable. So this is where the solid-state hard drive comes in. Because basically, over the years, we kept getting better and better and better and better at taking EEPROM, which is what we are ultimately going to refer to as flash memory, we got better at making it. And we got better at making it in larger and larger and larger quantities. So by the opening start of the 2010s, I remember being in high school, around 2010, and the conversation at that time was already including solid state hard drives. So by the early 2010s, solid state hard drives begin to exist. By the end of the 2000s, we have gotten good enough at creating flash memory in large enough quantities that we can conceivably start to think of using them as hard drives, replacing these spinning disk mechanisms completely. So these solid state drives are the same basic properties of the EEPROMs that are descendant from your ROM, your read-only memory. The read-only memory had a track, there's still you know, read-only memory, you can still get that, but there was an evolution from that starting point that ultimately grew into what we now call flash memory. All right? So flash memory is going to be uh, some combination of transistors and other electrical components on a, on a chip that can store data even if power is lost. Okay, that's the bit. Do I fully understand the engineering behind that? No, I don't, because I am not a computer engineer and I have nothing but respect for him, because damn. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anyway, the main thing about solid state drives is that solid state drives ultimately started becoming more and more and more accessible to the consumer because as like it's a i mentioned this on tuesday but it's a pretty established thing in just uh, manufacturing and it's the principle of mass production the idea that building something for the first time is going to be the most expensive but the better the more of it you build the better uh, at building it you get and the better at building something you get the more you can optimize the process and cut costs so the uh, pr principle of many of mass manufacturing is that as you make more of something the price of it goes down okay which at first might feel a little counterintuitive but you do see that pattern in most modern um, consumer products Right, early adopters buy the new shiny thing that is fucking expensive and doesn't necessarily work 100% quite yet. But as more of these products get sold and more of them get made to fulfill the demand, you start to kind of see a vicious cycle, right? You need to make more of the thing and so you get better at making the thing and as you get better at making the thing, you can start to optimize the process for making the thing. Optimizations almost always include some amount of cost savings and so as you make more of something, you can make it for cheaper. And so that's what we start to see with solid state hard drives. When they, start, when they first start emerging in the late 2000s, early 2010s, they are small. We're talking 32 gigabytes, maybe 64 gigabytes, and it's a pretty pricey drive to get that. And again, this is the late uh, 2000s, early 2010s. Hard drives are in the hundreds of gigabytes at this point. All right. By the late 2000s, the idea that everybody is going to be storing their movies there, and more so in, than, than now, actually. Nowadays, we kind of just kind of caved into the notion of the cloud, the idea that you don't actually own your music, you don't actually own your, your video content. You uh, rent a license to stream it temporarily. But back in the late 2000s, internet wasn't good enough to just stream everything, particularly not video. So the idea was you would buy your shit, you would buy your MP3s, you would buy your movies, and you would store them on a physical hard drive until death do us part, right? 
Our drug's gonna die before the you, but print still stands. And that was the idea, right? Data storage was a lot more important in the late 2000s. We didn't have the internet infrastructure to just stream everything. Um, and there was also a lot of grumpy people at the time who didn't like the idea for like principal reasons, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, so anyway, there is this, you know, storage space is important in this era, late, late 2000s, early 2010s. So having a hard drive that is only 32 or 64 gigabytes is kind of comical. Most operating systems take up most of that space. Like an OS in that time, 20, 30 gigs, right? Windows Vista comes out in 2006, 2005, something like, no, not 2005, 2006 or seven is when Windows Vista drops. And Windows Vista is a modern operating system, it's bulky, it's big. It's expecting you to have space on your hard drive. So, uh, ranting aside, the point being that in the early 2000s, you start to see an emergence of solid state disks starting to get just large enough to find practical use. The old trick you did back in the day, which I actually did myself, you had an old MacBook, MacBook Pro, they had a hard drive and they had a CD drive in them. And what you could do is you would take out your CD drive, put your spinning disk hard drive where the CD goes, and put your solid state drive where the hard drive goes. The idea being that the hard drive connection was the fastest one to your CPU, and that a solid state drive, because a solid state drive has no moving parts, it is orders of magnitude faster than spinning disk hard drives. While spinning disk hard drives has to physically move ahead and wait for a physical platter to spin its way around, a solid state drive can just electrically connect to the sector of data you want to retrieve and retrieve that data. <laughs> Happens almost instantly. So the trick back in the day was to connect your solid state drive to where the hard drive was meant to go, put your operating system on the solid state drive, but store all of your files on your slower spinning disk hard drive on the other portion of your machine. This would make the operating system boot very fast, right? Accessing all the files needed to load up the operating system went quick because a solid state drive was really, really fast. No moving parts. You could instantly access the memory locations you wanted. No waiting around for rotational latency or whatever. Um, and then, you know, if you wanted to load a movie, well, that's contiguous data anyway. So yeah, it's slower to load off a spinning disk hard drive, but once you open up VLC and start the film, the fact that it's gotta seek the rest of the film, it's gonna do that faster than the frames get rendered and the sound comes out of your ears, so you're not gonna notice. That was kind of the idea, right? Your apps and your OS would launch really fast, and the slower storage device would be used for the hunks of big data that you don't mind to take a little longer to load up. And this, while not ideal, starts to drive up demand for solid state drives. More and more people are buying them, which means prices go down. The cost per bit goes down. And by the late 2010s, solid state hard drives have gotten so good that most computer manufacturers ship them only. So most laptops by the late 2010s are only using solid state hard drives because they're just better. They're just better. They are faster, 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 and the storage capacities are about as large as a traditional spinning disk hard drive. All right. So solid state hard drives are pretty much just all around better. So um, I'm gonna skip these pages. Um, so I will add one thing before I do which is to say that there is technically a downside to solid state hard drives. And that is that data has to be read and written in units of pages, and a page can only be written after its block has been erased. And blocks wear out after around 100,000 repeated writes. So basically, a page is somewhere between ah, 512K to 4K, what? 512K to 4K, that's fucking not right. That is almost certainly supposed to be an M. Doesn't make any sense for it to be anything else. So basically, right, a, a page is somewhere between, you know, 512 kilobytes to four megabytes. That's small, that's, that's not a lot of information. Um, and up usually got 32 to 128 blocks per page, 
Okay. Um, or, no, no, no. Yeah, no, I'm right. So basically, data is read and written in units of pages. So the individual pages, all right, <clears throat> and a page can be written only after its block has been erased. So basically, you write your data in as chunks, but if you want to you know, erase one of those, you got to erase the whole thing and then keep writing over. Moral of the story is that an entire block wears out after around 100,000 repeated writes. So after you write the data around 100,000 times, the physical device just starts to fail. So this seems like maybe a pretty severe downside, right? Um, so I want to compare and contrast them right up, right up here. Basically, the advantages of a solid state hard drive is kind of as I've said already, there are no moving parts. The lecture slides talk about less power and that they're more rugged, and that is true. They consume less power because there's not a physical disk to spin up. Getting a whole hunk of metal, the platters, to spin at 7,200 RPMs, that takes a motor. That motor's got to pull power. And that power does add up. And it doesn't really mean too much for a desktop computer, but for a laptop, that does make a serious effect. Um, they're definitely more rugged. Spinning disk hard drives need to not, the, 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 the platter and the head can't come into contact with each other. If they do, it's game over. Like truly, it is game over. There's no recovering from that. Um, so having something without moving parts, less things to break. But the big thing, the thing that really drove this all forward was uh, it's faster. Because there are no moving parts, because there's no rotational latency, solid state hard drives just access their data so much faster. And it is um, pretty much the speed of the connection from the hard drive to the CPU that is the bottleneck. Because oftentimes the like, physical amount of distance that needs to be traveled from the CPU to the hard drive is a lot further than, say, to a general purpose register or to random access memory. Solid state drives are a lot slower. But um, compared to random access memory, solid state drives aren't that much slower. They're a lot faster than your old school spinning disk drives. Um, and the, that's the, those are the advantages. All right, they're, they're just, they're faster, they take less power, they're more robust. So that kind of seems like a home run. That seems like kind of a big W. And it is. The only real disadvantage here is that they do have the potential to wear out, but uh, the reality is, is that's not usually a problem. Because solid state drives these days have become so large, typically a lot larger than what most people are gonna put on all of them. And the reality is that most people don't really rewrite data very often, right? If you get a terabyte hard drive, you're probably dumping, I don't know, 10 years of vacation photos on there and then you're just not really thinking about it again, right? So with a lot of complicated engineering, i.e. the computer is lied to by the hard drive, the solid state hard drive, the solid state hard drive has its own internal logic that keeps track of where everything is and kind of lies to the computer about where it all is. So if the computer demands and insists to kind of keep rewriting the same block over and over, the actual hard drive will bullshit the computer and actually do the writes in different sectors all the time and just tell the computer that their data is where it wants it to be. This way, the hard drive can actually make sure that instead of accidentally taking a single quadrant of the drive and having it get to its 100,000 write limit and going bad while the rest of the drive is good, it will evenly distribute all writes across the entire drive so that the drive only starts to fail when you've written all of it 100,000 times, not just a specific chunk. And by doing this, Intel guarantees one petabyte of random writes before its random hard drive peters out. So unless you're like in a server farm or doing some very specific application where you're gonna be reading and writing an absolute ton of data, if you're just like a normal consumer, just like with a laptop, you're never gonna run into this potential to wear out problem. Your computer is gonna go wrong in a million other ways before the hard drive fails, okay? So it's like, yeah, there is technically a limit. There is technically a point that you will reach where the drive is no longer functional, um, but probably not gonna matter for 99% of the users. So we don't care. The speed benefit greatly outweighs that disadvantage. Um, the fuck? Okay, 
Um, that was a, that was an interesting set of noises. I don't know what robotic nonsense they're doing in the other room, but I'm sure it's something. Um, yeah, it sounds like a robot. Hey, we are in the College of Engineering, man. It's not a surprise that someone's doing robotics somewhere. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically what I want to say is that these slides are a little old. Uh, solid state hard drives have thoroughly kicked the teeth in on uh, uh, spinning disk hard drives. Technically, they are still more expensive per byte, but that only really matters when you're buying very large uh, storage reciprocals. Like if you're buying a, like a, something that has gigabyte on it, if you're buying a few hundred gigabytes, you're always going to get a solid state hard drive. The only time you really consider getting a spinning disk hard drive is if you're an idiot like me and want to get something that's like multiple terabytes large and don't want to pay a few hundred bucks per year per drive. Um, spinning disk hard drives are still cheaper. You can pick up an eight terabyte drive. I picked up mine for like a hundred like 10 each, I think, um, which is not nothing, but for eight terabytes each, 16 terabytes total, that's an insane amount of storage space. Um, and spinning disk does just fine. Um, I will say that the applications is kind of ridiculous. Solid state hard drives exist in everything. The only exception being servers. There are a lot of server applications that actually do do an ungodly amount of read writes. Um, and in those specific instances, the ability to last longer outweighs the speed increase you get from a solid state drive. Servers typically care more about reliability than speed because a lot of this data is being sent over a network connection anyway. So why care about the speed that your data can go from your drive to your CPU if the point of it is to then send it over a network pipe which is going to be slow as molasses relatively. So in like specific applications like servers, it makes more sense to where the speed doesn't really matter because all you're doing is retrieving and sending data down a slow molasses -y pipe. You want the reliability more than the speed. The speed doesn't matter to you. But that's in servers. And that's a very niche application. Pretty much everywhere else, solid state drives have taken, taken charge. Like it says MP3 players, which is comical. Like those still fucking exist. They don't. Smartphone, like everything else, it's like it's an interesting phenomenon, the smartphone era, um, with the technological consolidation. I'm just old enough to remember being a kid and having cargo pants when they weren't cool and they were just really cringe. Um, and I had them because I had a different device in everything. I had a Game Boy because I was a child, and I had a wallet made of duct tape because I was a child, and um, I had a digital camera because we had those then, and I had a phone, and I had an MP3 player. I just listed five things that are all a smartphone now. Technology converges into singular devices, or at least it has been. We can make it a two-in-one. We can make it a four-in-one. I don't know, it's just an interesting phenomenon. But I will make a, one final tangent here and say that MP3 players, when they were originally out in the late 1990s, there were some MP3 players that wanted to use flash memory because it was more robust, because it was, um, you know, stable. But the problem was is that in the late 90s, flash memory was too expensive per byte. So MP3 players that used flash memory typically were less than a gigabyte large. And for MP3s, a few hundred megabytes is not a lot of space, all right? particularly if you want the mp3s to sound good. But in the late 90s, the expectation was you would compress your music till it sounded awful, like it was coming over a tin can and a wire kind of awful. And then you could fit all the music you wanted, which is probably like 200 songs at most. Very different world back then. But when the original iPod came out in 2001, when the iPod showed up and revolutionized music, which it did do, the iPod got away with this because it had more storage capacity than anybody else. Because the Apple engineers were nuts and put a spinning disk hard drive in the original iPod. 20 gigabytes, which was a lot of space back then. Your entire music library in your pocket was the tagline. The idea being that it was revolutionary at that time to have a portable device designed to play MP3s with enough storage space to fit all the music you actually own. And Apple, kind of intended you to store it at at least a reasonable bit rate. 
128 kilobits doesn't sound good, but it also doesn't sound like actual ass. And if you did 256, you could still fit a decent amount on the original iPod. So it, it, it really does kind of go to show that that was one of the biggest linchpins of the iPod. They put a spinning hard drive, but it made it pretty, I mean, that was a pretty impressive piece of engineering, but it made it less stable. It made it easier prone to the hard drive breaking or failing, and that was a fail point on a lot of those things. Um, and I have an old iPod video back from 2005 that I um, took apart and put in a solid state, it's less of a drive and it's more just like a flash drive, but I put in some solid state memory and the thing goes way faster now. But just, it's been, an, and I, I, I wanna say this just because I wanna bring up the spinning disk hard drives because I do think it helps give context to our current conversations about storage and memory to understand that the world evolved into what we have now, that we had these spinning disks, that those kept growing in terms of what they could store and how fast they could retrieve what they stored, whereas solid state drives, flash media only, was something that emerged after and then alongside spinning disks and eventually took over in most cases as the disadvantages started to be outweighed by the advantages. But this was like a long drawn out process. And it, I think is good, especially as computer scientists to understand the distinction between solid states and spinning disks and why you might see one in some places, but you'd see the other in most others. I don't know, I just, I think that's important. And that's what this week is all about. Whatever I think is important. <laughs> Okay, so enough of me ranting. Oh, maybe I should actually like seriously consider going through my slide deck. Okay, that's enough about memory. Um, <clears throat> I will actually focus on communicating these ideas a little bit more uh, focused. But basically, what I want to talk about next are CPU speeds. CPU speeds. So uh, basically, I've said this before, but basically it used to be back in the day that our computer processors got faster every 18 months or so because we would double the number of transistors on a chip vis-a-vis -vis Moore's law, and then we would just turn up the clock speed. Turn up the clock speed, right? More cycles in a second. More cycles in a second means more instructions can be executed in a second, which means your computer can go faster. But around the early 2000s, we hit what is known as the power wall. What the hell is that? Well, there is a relationship between processor frequency and power, okay? As frequency increases, so does power consumption, okay? I have a little formula there, right? Um, and basically, it is a... Uh, cubic thing because when the frequency goes up the voltage is a square right so there is a drastic increase in power consumption as we increase the frequency of our cpus and this is what causes a problem the power wall is a rough limit of how fast a cpu's clock speed can be <coughs> before it puts out too much heat to be commercially viable if your laptop was gonna give you second degree burns, if you use it too long, nobody's gonna buy your fucking laptop. So computer manufacturers kind of hit a wall, right? They ended up kind of realizing that they can't make their CPUs go any faster. They had to use other tricks to put more transistors on there and sell you a chip that was newer and better, right? Can't just make it go faster. Can't just put more horsepower in it metaphorically. They have to give you other features. So, um, is that particularly important? Sure. Um, now, this power wall is very interesting. It kind of it, it describes why, come the mid-2000s, you see a move away from making CPUs go faster and making CPUs capable of more by giving CPUs more hardware. By the mid-2000s, the idea of a multi-core chip comes into being, the idea that we can't make the CPU go any faster, but we can give you two in one, basically. We can give you a CPU that is basically just two CPUs in one. And that seemed like a really powerful idea at the start, because in theory, if you have two CPUs, you can do everything twice as fast, right? The problem is that most computer code, most software, is written under the idea that there is one CPU executing code 
is sequentially, one instruction after the other. We saw that in the LC3, right? Start at hex 3000 and increment the PC by one each time. So just because there's now two CPUs doesn't mean you can just cut all your work time in half because a lot of your programming expects things to be executed sequentially. And it turns out that there's been a large effort to do two things. One, to, well, there's been a huge effort to do one main thing, which is that writing code that can successfully take advantage of the multiple CPU cores that are on your machine takes effort. Some languages, like common list, like functional languages, it's actually not that much effort. Common Lisp is very naturally parallelizable. You can very easily execute it in parallel on multiple CPUs at once. But that involves you learning Common Lisp, which you uh, ask anyone in 403, it's a fucking nightmare. Nobody really likes doing it, all right? So the other alternative is to take languages that we recognize, that we see, that we understand, like Java, and we program it in a way where it can know what work is safe to do in parallel, right? Where you can do part A and part B at the same time and it doesn't mess each part up, and what parts aren't. And there's a lot of effort. I remember taking a grad course on this way back in the day. There's a lot of effort that goes into making sure that that actually works, that you can write code that executes on one CPU, and then the next step execute sequentially at the same time on like several different CPUs, and then they all sync up, and then they just go back to one CPU for the stuff that can't be done at the same time. That process of writing parallel code, it's very, very hard. It's very pain in the ass, very easy to mess up. It's really hard to debug because the second you stop everything and you start debugging it, you have now frozen the system, which is probably gonna alleviate the problem that you had. So um, that's kind of what came out of the pot power wall was the emergence of multi-core chips and the software industry running to figure out how to utilize these chips. Most modern machines have like eight cores in them or whatever. Your phone probably has at least four, probably eight. And the other thing is that modern software, you tend to be running multiple things at once. So yeah, traditionally some apps will get their own CPU core. But who gets what is really not a question to answer here. That's usually up to the operating system. But anyway, that's not particularly relevant to the rest of the slide deck. I just wanted to mention it because I think it's interesting, and that's, again, the point of this unit. What do I think is interesting? Um, well, what I want to continue to talk about is the CPU memory gap. Because as the CPU has gotten bonkers fast, right, absolutely like truly, I cannot overstate enough how absolutely unhinged the progress in CPU speed and power was. Not even 50 years ago, these things didn't exist or just came into being. Truly, the birth of the CPU is maybe 50, 51 years ago, if I'm being nitpicky. Now, they are unfathomably fast. The progress was an exponential curve, and that's just something you don't see in human engineering like ever. It is truly something that stands out in the parth uh, pantheon of human achievement. So truly, it is almost unfathomable how much CPU speeds improved and how short of a time they did it. How much more powerful a CPU is now from when the CPU started in 50 years ago is mind-boggling particularly that first stretch of 30 years. So what does that really mean for us here? Well, what it means is that because CPUs shot up like a rocket in a way almost nothing else humans have ever conceived of has, shocker, the rest of computer components didn't really go as fast. So it turns out that we have a gap between how fast a CPU is and can execute instructions and how fast every other component of the computer is. And so what this creates is a system where the CPU can execute instructions faster than it can be given instructions. Okay. We see here that this is a log scale in nanoseconds. We see that spinning disk speeds kind of top out at around 100 or 10 million nanosecond access time. We see solid state drives drop all the way down to 100,000 nanoseconds. 
So again, that's what? Two orders of magnitude from a spinning disk to a solid state drive? Solid state drives are gonna make your computer go way faster. But uh, the CPU is uh, executing instructions every few nanoseconds or so, okay? Somewhere down here. That's one CPU cycle, and usually it takes a few cycles for a single instruction to execute, but you know, splitting hairs we don't need to split. So basically, even though SSDs have way faster access time than spinning disks, CPUs can still rip through instructions orders of magnitude faster than your SSD can provide them. But we don't use the SSD to like, you know, that's what memory is for, that's what main memory, that's what RAM is for. Oh, but then we look at DRAM, and DRAM is still at 100 nanosecond access time, which is way better than solid state drives, but still way slower than CPUs. So, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with the fact that our CPU can consume instructions faster than any storage device can send it to them? Well, that's not what I wanted to say. Storage, local, speedy storage, caching. So we see here this, this circle line. The circle line is SRAM. Those are your caches or your registers. Right? Your L1 cache, your L2 cache. We haven't really talked about what those do, but we can see that they're way faster than our random access memory. So, what we are going to do in order to solve this problem is to take instructions and data that the CPU is you know, gonna need soon and store them in cache memory so that they can be accessed way faster than if you had to go all the way to RAM or God forbid, all the way to your solid state hard drive to go fetch the instructions. But that only works because of the principle of locality. So the key to bridging this gap is a fundamental pro uh, property of computer programs known as locality. There's gonna be two types. So the principle of locality is the idea that programs tend to reuse data and instructions near those that they have used recently or that were recently referenced themselves. Okay. So <clears throat> there's two types of locality here, spatteral and temporal. So spatteral, I think I'm saying that right, I don't care. Items with nearby addresses tend to be referenced close together in time which, again, I don't have like proofs for these. These aren't things that are undeniably true. These are just true most of the time. And I know that this is true most of the time because the past 25 years of computer engineering have assumed these are true most of the time. And if they weren't, you know, someone would have been like, hey, we're losing money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Over the past quarter century, if this wasn't true, someone would have been like, yo, we're losing money doing this and we would have investigated. Um, but, so I don't have like a math proof for you. It doesn't have to be true. You can write code that goes out of its way to not act like this, but just normal code written by normal developers trying to do normal things tend to act like this. So the uh, spatteral locality is that items with nearby addresses tend to be referenced close together in time. Temporal locality is that recently referenced items are likely to be referenced again in the future. You'll need to know that, by the way. All nine of you watching, you should, you should know that. So, so do, 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 do I really care? I mean, sure, let's, let's give some examples. So, um, is it just do, okay, yeah, whatever, yeah. So basically, we have some data references, right? We reference array elements in succession, that's gonna be a spatteral locality. The idea, if you have an array that's stored contiguously in memory, you know, so if you need array index zero, you're probably gonna need the rest of the array relatively soon. You know, you reference variable sum on each iteration of this code in the top right hand corner, and that's gonna be temporal locality, right? We're checking the same value over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then through the instruction references, right? The reference instructions in a sequence is gonna be spatteral locality, the idea that if you assemble that loop into machine instructions, right? You're gonna be repeating those same machine instructions over and over as you loop and repeat them. So the actual um, instructions in the sequence 
you know, if there's say 20, 30, 40 CPU instructions, when you get the first one, you know you're probably gonna need the next 40 pretty soon. And because it's a loop, those 40 instructions, you're going to repeat over and over, which is temporal locality, right? Those 40 instructions that make up the loop, you're gonna need to use over and over and over again until the loop is done. So this is what we mean, right? The idea is that just in a standard loop, which is something almost all of our code has, right? Then we're going to see this locality come up. Sometimes when we access the first element of the array, we know we're gonna access all the others or some of the others soon, you know, spatteral locality. Right? The idea that, hey, this is next to this, we're probably gonna need them soon. Temporal locality is like the sum variable. Hey, we're gonna need to keep updating and accessing this value because it's part of the loop. We're gonna be checking this over and over and over and over again. So these things do show up in our program code, right? We can see that there are times where we access the same data and over and over again, or we access one piece of data and some of its neighbors are soon to be next. So, buddy, I, I get it. I want to talk about that, but why do we have to start talking about that now? Um, this is so dumb. Okay, I'll talk about it here just to make a point. Um, okay, whatever, man. That's weird. If you're watching this, there's weird noises in the lecture room, okay? Pipes and stuff, I'm sorry. Just that's why I'm perking up my ears. I don't know if the mic catches that. Probably doesn't. So anyway, uh, this is a quirky thing that I don't want to spend too much time on. It's not something I... The claim is stupid, okay? It's a good thing for you guys to know. This is like a textbook interview question that someone being an ass would love to throw at you, but it's not very practical. Basically, the point that's trying to be made here is that do these functions have good locality with respect to array A? And basically, these loops are the exact same. Array A is a 2D array. The difference is that one of these arrays is going over row, is going row by row, and the other is going column by column. Otherwise, they're exactly the same. And the question is, do these have good um, locality? And the answer is, well, it depends. Traditionally, arrays are stored in memory in row major order, i.e. you store one row of contiguous data, and then you store the second row of contiguous data, and then the third row of contiguous data, et cetera, et cetera. And so if that is the situation that you're in, the loop that is going over the row first and then each column in the row is going to have better locality. Because if you're going over one row and then every element in the row and your data is stored as an entire row at once, then you're going to be accessing data that is right next to each other for the loop. And that's gonna have a better locality to it, right? You're gonna be accessing things that are closer to the last thing as opposed to farther away. Whereas if you go over this by column, right, you're gonna have to be hopscotching through memory. If you store all your data as one row, another row, another row, another row, instead of being able to just read through it linearly, you have to hopscotch from different chunks of memory to different chunks of memory. This is going to have worse locality. And worse locality, as we're going to see on the next few slides, is going to, um, is going to make it um, worse, right? Slower. So traditionally, this is why you've wanted to do row first, column second, so that you're leveraging locality to the best of your ability. And sometimes languages actually use column major order. A language I know that does this is Fortran. Fortran stores columns of data in computer memory contiguously and stores them that way. So if you're doing this in Fortran, you would want to do column-based searching. So why am I not emphasizing this? Because this slide says that going a column order way over a loop stored in this way is going to give you a 21 time slowdown. Why am I not stressing 
over a choice or a potential choice that would slow your code down by 21 times. The reason I'm not stressing is this isn't 1993 anymore. Whoever wrote these slides needs a reality check. Modern day compilers are smarter than we tend to give them credit for. No compiler written by anyone who isn't just screwing around isn't going to see this and optimize it away. If your compiler recognizes that you're going column order first, row second, and then that's a huge inefficiency and that there's no programmatic need to do it that way, you're just feeling like it, the compiler will fix your code. The compiler will straight up, like if the, comp if the C compiler sees you doing this, right, the C compiler will just flip it. The C compiler would be like, hey, you're going, you're, you're looking at each column and then looking at each element in the column and that's very inefficient vis-a-vis -vis locality and there's no need to do it that way. So I'm gonna think you're an idiot and I'm gonna fix it for you. It actually is kind of a funny inversion. So often as programmers, and again, I've got qualms with this take, but there's some truth to it. As programmers, we're always kind of told the user is a complete idiot. Do not trust the user, they're a fucking moron. Right? That tends to be the, the, the way we're told to design our software. But um, humble check for a second, who do you think is the main target audience of a compiler? It's programmers. We're the user now. And the compilers think we're a bunch of idiots. They probably have a point. So the compiler fixes it for you. Instead of just hoping that your programmer recognizes this, and it was one of the three people to show up in person today, and you on the live stream, I'm glad you guys do. Um, you know what I mean? Like, that is a very, you know, that's, that's a very easy thing to miss, and that's a huge penalty for missing it. So pretty much every modern compiler will just fix it for you. So that's why I'm not stressing about it. It's, yeah, it's true, it, it's, it's correct. If you write code that has very bad locality, you will slow your code down. It's just most of the time when you do that, your compiler will recognize that and fix it for you. Unless it can't, because sometimes your program just will have bad locality and that just means your code will go slower and uh, oops, not much you can do about it, right? So um, yeah. complement each other beautifully. What, I mean, yeah man, we already talked about the memory hierarchy. Whatever, <clears throat> I'm ignoring all that. I said everything on those slides and I don't know the direction of these slides. I like some of the material, but clearly these aren't, these aren't as sharp as the rest of the lecture, uh, the rest of the semester. So basically what I wanna talk about is I wanna take a leverage, I wanna, I wanna leverage what we've learned about locality, which again, Locality, just the principle that things that we use are probably gonna be used again, both in spatter locality, the idea of we use one thing, things next to it will probably get used soon, and temporal locality, that if we use something, we're probably gonna use it again, right? Those are our two types of locality, and ignoring all the other things about it, how can we take advantage? How can we leverage the knowledge that we're probably gonna use things next to us, and this thing again, soon, how do we leverage that into going faster? And the answer is cache. Cache is a smaller, faster storage device that acts as a staging area for a subset of the data in a larger, slower device. And it is kind of like the main point of the memory hierarchy, right? The idea that we store everything we need for the program in uh, main memory, but that we can store subsets of that data in the caches. Right? The subsets in the cache, it's only a subset, so if we need something not in the cache, we've got to go take the long road all the way down to main memory. But if what we are looking for is in the cache, then we can access it a lot faster. And it, because of the principle of locality, we can have a pretty good ballpark of what needs to go in these caches. Right? If we access a piece of data, probably should take its neighbors and just chuck it in the L1 cache because spatter locality tells us we're probably gonna need the neighbor soon anyway, and temporal locality tells us we're probably gonna need this guy again soon. So the idea is if we know that's the subset we're working with, you can take that subset of data and put it in the L1 cache, and then the CPU can access it way faster than if it had to run all the way to main memory each time. That's the big idea. So, 
Uh, roughly speaking, before I go through this, because this is all just contrived, I want to really emphasize that. These are theories that are good, and they're sound, and they're what's used in modern computing, but I'm doing it at such a sky-high level that it doesn't really mean anything other than a loose theory. This is, roughly speaking, how things work, and that part's true, but when you get into the details, they get nitty-gritty, they get dirty, and there's a lot of details that go into making this work well. The principle of how it works, I don't think is that bad to understand. The principle of how to make it work well is kind of a nightmare. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things where like the concept is on a high level fine, but once you start getting in the weeds, it's like not gonna make a Harry Potter reference in 2024, but it is kind of like the Chamber of Secrets where it will kind of wrap you up and eat you if you're not careful. Um, is that the Chamber of Secrets? Or is that the first one? I don't know, it's one of the good ones. I promise, look, just as, as, a, as a young millennial, I need to just say something for a second. Harry Potter got good, got, look, that author knew how to write children's books, all right? The world building was shit, but it didn't matter. You, you lived vicarious through the 11-year-old that was Harry Potter, worked really well, and then she got cultural momentum, and everyone was obsessed, and all of a sudden, the guy grew up, and she had to write books for a teenager and an adult, and she was bad at it. She was very bad at it, but it was too late. People already loved the character. Um, and now look at where that's gotten her. Um, <laughs> asshole. Um, but anyway, again, apologies that the ADHD is just on full blast for these lectures, but it's April, and that's what we're doing here. So basically, the cash concept here that I'm talking about is accurate. It's just very high level, and it's not super specific. But this is the general principle. I just don't want to get into the weeds too much. So the idea here is that you, know, you have a cache of some of the data, and it's a subset of the larger chunk of memory. Um, and data is copied in block-sized units. So if we need block four, we look for it in the cache. We don't see it in the cache, so we move it from main memory into the cache. There we go. We need block 10. It's not in the cache, so we go to main memory, copy it into the cache. All right? Um, that's kind of the idea. So the idea of a cache hit is the CPU wants a specific piece of data. It requests block 14. And again, we're just thinking of these in blocks because moving things byte by byte is not very efficient. So if we need a piece of data, we'll just take it as a whole chunk. That's kind of the principle here. It just makes things easier to think about and it makes things go faster on a hardware level. So if the CPU wants block 14, we ask the cache, do you have block 14? It does, so it just sends it over. If there's a miss, data asks for block 12. Block 12 is not in the cache, so we have to go down to memory, fetch it, and then put it in the cache. And then the way it typically works, if I'm not misspeaking, and I do not believe that I am, the way it typically works is that the cache if you go and you make a cache miss, it doesn't actually send the data to the CPU. What it does is it sees that the cache miss happened, so it goes to main memory, fetches the data it wanted, puts it into the cache, and then the CPU makes the request again, but now this time the data the CPU wants is actually gonna be in the cache and you're gonna get a cache hit and move on. So the weeds that we're not gonna get too into are Placement and replacement policy. So when we summon block 12 from main memory and we put it into the cache, where in the cache does it go and what does it evict from the cache? Right? The cache is always going to have data in it. So what's getting the boot? Um, what's getting the boot is a great question. <laughs> that is... Basically, placement and replacement policy is a huge rat it's a huge thing that I'm not getting into because it, you can't unless you have more context. Like it's one of those things that like I can't really talk about unless we had a lot more specific details of a specific system and how that system would handle it. Different systems can handle this different ways. Basically, a placement and replacement policy is just an algorithm, right? <clears throat> you could make a bad one, a relatively naive one. Right? You could just say, hey, whatever block was last touched, or like, 
Whichever one hasn't been accessed the longest, you know, which one's been sitting in the cache the longest, that one gets evicted. It's probably not going to be needed anymore. I mean, that is a solid uh, replacement policy. It even goes with placement policy, right? Oh, we need to take a piece of data and put it into the cache. Where does it go? What does it replace? We'll find the block of cache that has been in the cache the longest and kick that guy out. That's a very basic, simple approach, and it's something that I think on a somewhat intuitive level would make sense and probably would work. But I'm sure if you get the engineers to look at it and do some actual research and analysis and math, they probably would find out that, hey, actually checking to see when each cache block was last accessed takes more time than we would really like. This cache is four blocks, but these caches might be hundreds or thousands of blocks, so checking when the last time each one was accessed might actually be a lot of time, right? And so we might start having more and more complicated placement replacement policies that maybe aren't as good in a strict locality sense, but can occur so fast that we don't care. All of this is just meant to make the computer go faster, so if we end up taking too long determining what to evict from the cache, we're getting rid of the speed boost that having a cache provides us, and we should just access main memory directly. So it's like a tension here, right? The point is to make it so that accessing data is faster. So we want to make sure the data we want is probably in the cache. But figuring out what to evict from the cache to put in a new block, we can't have take too long, or else it is going to eat up our speed up. And um, we don't want that, right? So basically, there are three types of misses here. There's a cold miss, which is just when you first turn on the machine, the cache will be empty, so you're going to miss because there's nothing in the cache yet. That's fine. That's normal. That's just standard. A conflict miss is um, basically a conflict miss is this, right? When you're looking for a piece of data and it's not there, it is mentioning here conflict misses occur when level k cache is large enough, the multiple data objects all map to the same level k block. Ugh. Basically, they're saying the algorithm for replacement has more to do with physical position than it does last access time because physical position in memory is a lot easier to calculate and work with. And so in theory, if you're accessing the same blocks that unfortunately overline with the math in a certain way where block 0 and block 8 would always end up in the same location in the cache, then accessing 080808 would be a string of misses, right? You want to get 0, so you have to evict something. You put 0 in, then you want 8, and that's going to naturally evict 0, and then you need 0, so it evicts 8, and you need, you know, it loops. Again, the algorithm for placement and replacement policy is what's going to determine this, right? If you want a very simple algorithm of take the position or the number block that you have, mod it by something, and then the number, like, you know, the, the numeric value of the block mod four is which of the four slots in the cache it goes into, that's very quick, right? It's a single mod instruction. That does, you're not going to eat up your speed up. But if you unfortunately have a thing where you need to get 08080808 and 0 and 8 mod whatever equal the same thing, you're going to end up kicking the same block out over and over again. This is what I mean by like determining your cache replacement policy is a huge rat's nest. There's a lot of different ways you can do it, and they have their ups and their downs. A capacity miss is really the worst, which occurs when the set of active cache blocks is larger than the cache itself. Like, if say the computer in this example needed five of these blocks pretty much regularly, you know, say the loop it's executing encompasses five blocks worth of data, and your cache holds four blocks of data, then you're gonna miss a lot. Okay. Um, ay ay ay. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Um, yes. 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 Okay, basically this big old chart here talks about a lot of things that aren't particularly important here, but 
What we can see is that the L1 and the L2 cache are caching 64 byte blocks and they're caching them on the chips and they have a certain amount of average latency. And so the idea here is that rather than accessing um, main memory, which is probably down here with a latency of like 100,000, you know, you can access them with a latency of 1 in 10. Just like, I don't know, I, I really want to stress the principle more than the details here. Like the principle of like, hey man, if it is a further distance from your CPU to your main memory, but you've got a small little midpoint station called a cache, if you put the things that you're going to access most often in that little cache, then the journey between the cache and the CPU is much shorter, and so the CPU can get its instructions much faster. The big question becomes, how do you determine what data goes in the cache? And that can be an entire semester worth of conversation. Like, truly, it can be. The last thing I want to mention here is that, um, wait, no, that's next week. That's all next week. That's what virtual memory is. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we're going to talk about virtual memory on uh, next Tuesday, and I will try to be somewhat more focused. <laughs> Thank you for putting up with this very ADHD-ass lecture. Uh, I really appreciate that, y'all. Um, but yeah, I'll see you back uh, on Tuesday. That's going to be our last lecture next Tuesday. And then after next Tuesday, I think that's it. I'm going to have a demo day where I just kind of bring in some stuff I've been working on and show it. And then we're going to have a class review. And then I'm probably going to have a day or two of class where we just don't meet. So thank you all so much for being here. I'll see you on Tuesday. Bye, everybody.